Once again, good evening. My name is Ron Martin Wilson, and just that this is my distinct privilege to introduce Professor P. Adam Sidney, who will speak this evening on the subject of Dante and Italian cinema. So it is, by the same token, my distinct responsibility to warn you as well. By none other than Professor Sidney himself, who detests all academic encomium, particularly when directed at himself, I have been warned to keep these words short and free of vulgar ornamentation. <laughs> of course, a warning to you about Professor Sidney himself might not be wholly inappropriate. As he himself might agree, when I met Professor Sidney at Princeton University and expressed an interest in studying experimental film, about which his book, Visionary Film, is one of the first and the greatest, you might have thought I was trying to convert to Judaism, by which I mean this, as if ritualistically to test my sincerity, Professor Sidney once, twice, three times rejected my entreaty, loudly discouraging me from joining the ranks of those special people who find themselves, for whatever reason, called upon to stare into the most extreme and challenging examples of cinematic revelation that mankind has yet produced. Although Sidney was and is himself a leading voice in scholarship on avant-garde cinema, he discouraged me from studying it formally. Why, you might wonder. By his lights, as the American Academy in general, and film studies perhaps in particular, sink into senescence and degeneracy, there is, he told me back then, simply no future in it. Why study avant-garde film professionally? To what, he pleaded earnestly, could it possibly lead in this terrible era? I'd like to think that in tonight's lecture itself, the title of which again is Dante and Italian Cinema, Professor P. Adam Sidney has his answer to that question, namely, because it has led to this extraordinary evening, the evidence of things even he may have left undreamed. Please help me again to welcome Professor P. Adam Sidney to St. John's College. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. You all are very lucky to have such a tutor as Ron Wilson here. He was one of the very, very best assistants I ever had at Princeton. And uh, he loves it here, as he should, because since most of the American academic world has committed suicide, there are very, very few places that are any good anymore. Two of them are called St. John's. <laughs> One of them is called uh, Thomas Aquinas. I wouldn't lecture anywhere else at my old age. Um, you know, because it's just ridiculous what is happening in the academic world. My son, Blake, who's here, graduated from uh, St. John's at Santa Fe in 92. And a few years ago, he sent me a note saying that in the summer they're giving a film course. And I said, oh, shit. A film course at St. John's, because of course there's no film ever made that comes anywhere near the books you read in the curriculum, none. I said, well, they have to make some money, so send me a list of the films. And I figured it would be like the taste of Princeton professors, total dreck, you know, the worst crap imaginable. And he sent me the list, and they were all terrific films. They were all the kind of films that I would teach myself, except for there were no avant-garde films on it, but still, there were wonderful films. And I said, oh, isn't it a terrible shame? But it's the way the world is that they have to look at these films on DVDs or digital things. I haven't been to a movie in a decade because I can't stand to look at digital stuff. I use it for, you know, excerpts for lectures, but it's, it's no way to see them. And then um, Professor uh, uh, Carl told me, no, no, we're not showing DVDs. We're showing 35 millimeter prints in a local theater in Santa Fe. And so I, I contacted Blake and I said, hey, Blake, 
They're doing the real thing at St. John's. They're treating film seriously. You should dig into your pockets and provide a scholarship, because it costs a great deal of money to take this course. And he provided two. The next year, they didn't ask him for money. So I asked, what's going on? And it turns out that the local people of Santa Fe so support this screening of real films shown on celluloid that it pays, that their admission price pays for the costs of, of the seminar. So St. John's is a wonderful place. God bless it. Um, <laughs> the only thing odd is that I've been both here at seminars and in, in Annapolis, is this uh, what Freud called the narcissism of minor differences. There they, they complain about you and you complain about them. And <laughs> the only difference I can see is the difference between brick and adobe. <laughs> it's, it's, it's exactly the same. So there are two principles underlying my talk today. One, that Italian culture is permeated with Dante. There's no escaping Dante if you're an, Ita if you're an Italian who's gone through a normal education. In fact, even more than Shakespeare in the English and American world, the Italian language itself is influenced by Dante. Part of the choice of the Florentine dialect to be the official language of Italy in the 19th century came from the fact that Dante wrote in the, in the Florentine uh, dialect. In fact, when I think about our concept of Shakespeare, we use words and phrases from Shakespeare without even knowing it. My mother, who was completely uneducated, she didn't go to high school and I don't think she got much of an education before that, would constantly quote Shakespeare without knowing it was Shakespeare or knowing where it came from. Um, uh, you know, all that glitters isn't gold, she might say or to be or not to be, or brave new world, or good night, sweet prince, or tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. These were the sort of things that she would say. She had an endless store of cliches. There never was a cliche she didn't love. Um, and uh, that is part of the degree to which Shakespeare permeates our culture. Now, if you're more educated, it's hard to say these things without irony. Educated people, who might say, good night, sweet prince, know the context and use the phrase ironically. But it isn't just phrases. There are certain fundamental scenes. For instance, if there's a story involving a sword fight, poison swords, and they get mixed up, people recognize it. Or a magician and his daughter are stranded on an enchanted um, island or a wealthy young man um, who is a bit of a, a cut up suddenly inherits his father's money and power and he cuts off his best friend as a result. These are the kinds of scenes that we recognize, that educated people recognize as coming from Shakespeare. Now anyone in Italian culture who has gone to a gymnasium, not only knows Dante and knows Dantean phrases, but has also studied Virgil. And in fact, I'm going to show you an excerpt from a film called Padre Padrone, which is about Italian education, in which such an ex, uh, such a instance of Virgilian <coughs> education in relationship to Dante is very important. Now, the second principle. And this is a critical principle I believe in, and it's, it's fashioned almost all of my work. When in a literary work or a film, there is an allusion to one of these great scenes or these great words, it is incumbent on the critic, the professor, the interpreter, to pay close attention to them, because very often these, these moments reveal the internal hidden structure of the entire work. And that will be my point today, that certain allusions, certain scene structures in Italian, in the major Italian films of the greatest period of Italian film production, that is between the early 1950s and up till the 1970s, um, often turn on such Dantean allusions. My first example will be 
from La Dolce Vita. Now, La Dolce Vita was the most successful film ever made in Italy. It was so successful that the photographer who travels with the protagonist has given his last name to his entire profession. He has a Sicilian name, Paparazzo. And 70 years later, we still refer to, to gossip and celebrity photographers as paparazzi after this character whom we will soon see in a helicopter with the protagonist Marcello. So may I have the first excerpt? This is from the very first scene of La Dolce Vita. So a helicopter is delivering a statue of Christ to the Vatican. Now we have to pay very close attention to the structure of the scenes. Here are some women sunbathing on a roof. Guarda, è Gesù. And of course, Jake, no Italian would refer to Christ as Jesus. That's Now we see the protagonist for the first time across the impossible distance and the noise of the helicopter trying to pick up these women on the roof. Pay particular attention to the structure of this impossible scene, the distance and the noise and the gestures. The photographer is Paparazzo, and the writer is Marcello. <laughs> now, it's very important in an episodic film to, set, to notice the way in which episodes are put together, the cuts, the splices. So there will be a very important splice from the Statue of Christ to a Thai mask in a nightclub. So as the Statue of Christ descends upon us and upon the Vatican, to an exotic performance in a nightclub. <laughs> Where Fellini is telling us that... Senti, al tavolo numero 16, che cosa hanno mangiato? Il principe ha mangiato del lumacco. E cosa hanno bevuto? Okay, that's enough of this one. So Marcello is a gossip columnist, and what he wants to find out is what Il Principe, a, a, an aristocrat, ate for his dinner, for his gossip column. Now, he will later meet his friend Steiner, a classic liberal who is the most sinister character in the entire film, who begs him to stop working for a semi-fascist newspaper. Fellini said that in making this film, he was making the story, telling the story of a private man having nothing to do with politics. That's simply untrue. Many of the things filmmakers say about their films are untrue, and they're interesting clues to what is the real truth. This film was made at a crucial, critical period in Italian history. It was just, uh, the Ita Italian government is a government based upon an assembly. And the leading party in that assembly gets to name the prime minister and the cabinet and to set the, the tone. The uh, Democratic Christian Party dominated since the Second World War the assembly in Italy. But it was a moment in which their support was weak. And the, they had to turn to the fascist, the legal fascist party, to get enough support to keep the Tambroni government, the Zoli government and the Tambroni government in power. And this is just at this moment when fascism is enjoying a resurgence in Italy to keep uh, the assembly from making an arrangement of incorporating the communist and socialist 
the turn to the left in order to control the power. And there's a very interesting moment where Marcello's father shows up to visit him. And he goes to this Kit Kat club. And he says to the waiter, were you here? I haven't been here since 1922. Um, and to say 1922 in Italy is like saying 1776 in the US. 1922 is when the black shirts marched on Rome. So Marcello's father, who is a affluent, retired champagne importer, was initially probably a black shirt, like father, like son. This fascist or, or semi-fascist father is a figure for the, the semi-fascist son. Not only that, but the father has measured his entire life in terms of his penis, as does Marcello, his son. Like father, like son. This is a film about fathers and sons. That's why Steiner, who kills his own children, is such a sinister character. Okay, let's look at this excerpt and listen very carefully to what the old man says. Il n'a-t-il champagne? Sicuro. Ecco. Et anche la cameriera, cosa volete di più? Fanny. Piacere. Non, non, non ti disturbo. Te non ti saluto, ma anche te. Ah, hai visto come lavori il tuo figlio? Eh, l'ho visto, Bel visto. lavoro, eh? Mondano il tuo paesello, va. <ride> Senta, Dica. ma non è vero che il tuo papà... Come non è vero? Non è possibile, è troppo giovane. Per carità, Listen. signorina, lasci stare l'età. Non rinnoviamo disperato dolore che il cor mi preme. <laughs> That's Dante, he's quoting. Altri alla noia. Io primi a fare viaggiavo sovente da giovane. Quando ero in viaggio mi sentivo un leone. Anche adesso, appena mi muovo, le giuro che non sto dietro a nessuno di questi ragazzi. Okay, enough of that. Quando... So, he quotes this phrase from Count Ugolino. In, at the very depths of hell. Ugolino is, is dining on Cardinal Ruggeri's head. He's a cannibal. And what has happened in Inferno, Inferno is the realm of the Medusa. The Medusa appears in Inferno 10, and she is the force of turning things to stone. Because in Inferno, everything is taken literally. It's a, the place where people do not understand the signs of redemption. They take things literally. So what we see at first is a stone Christ. It's not a real Christ, it's a stone Christ delivered to the Vatican. Now Dante, of course, hated the Vatican and, uh, and for, for good reasons. Ruggiero uh, has walled up Ugolino and his children in a tower, and they're starving to death. And at a certain point, Ugolino's children say, Father, you're dying and we're dying. Why don't you eat us? And what he misses is the Christological and biblical illusion there. This is, is a classic theological topos. It's the story of Abraham and Isaac, the story of Jesus and God the Father. Jesus who sacrifices himself for the Father. And what, instead of Ugolino saying, my God, this is Christ speaking to us. Let us all get down on our knees and pray. Instead, he either dies or eats his children. It's ambiguous. And he will for all eternity munch on and devour the head of Cardinal Ruggino, who tied him up there. Now, it's perfectly legitimate for the pilgrim, for Dante and Virgil, in hell, to be sadistic and to say, tell us your story. Because the, the source of this great line is the Aeneid, book two, where Dido asks Aeneas to tell the story of Troy. She knows that his wife has died at Troy, and Troy has been destroyed, but she's a, a, a queen, and she says, tell us the story. Infandum, Regina, unspeakable queen. You uh, base me renovare dolorum. You ask, you order me to, to speak, queen, this to, to renew this unspeakable grief. It's as bad as if, let's say, 
a young Chinese kid says to his great grandmother, hey, granny, tell us about uh, what it was like in Shanghai when the Japanese came there. Or you can imagine a young Jewish kid saying, Bubby, tell us about Auschwitz. I want all the details. These are things you don't say, you don't do. But of course, it's legitimate in hell to do it. But here, what does, what does Marcello's father say? He, he says that Fanny is asking him to renew the great grief of growing old. And yet he brags that he is as, he may not be as handsome, but he's as powerful, he's the lion he always was. And of course, Fanny will seduce him. Why will she seduce him? Not because she thinks he's so attractive, because she is trying to curry favor with Marcello to get her name in his newspapers. And when she does take the father to her rooms, he is unable to perform. And in shame, he leaves. So basically, what we have is a clue to the inherited horror of Marcello. Marcello, who imitates his father in every respect, politically, sexually, socially, is uh, condemned, is a willing figure to remain in the hell of the Dolce Vita. Um, at the end of the, the film, there is a uh, celebration of a divorce. And after divorce, the people go to the beach. Now, I want you to be particularly careful in listening to what they say, because there's a phrase in French. This strange creature is dragged out of the sea. And one uh, uh, character who is a kind of stage homosexual says in French, il est plein de meduse, it's full of, full of jellyfish. But uh, Fellini smuggles in at this moment the idea of the medusa. Not only that, notice that it's, this is the beginning of the scene. It's in a, a pine grove at the shore. Now, Dante himself was exiled from Florence and lived in Ravenna, where he died and is buried. And when he described the earthly paradise, he described it in terms of the harbor of Ravenna, Chiasi, where the little birds sing in the pines of Chiasi. And there, in this earthly paradise, as the pilgrim is in the earthly paradise, he encounters an enchanted, enchanting and enchanted young woman across a watery boundary, Matilda. And she marks the way towards his redemption. Marcello has encountered already this kind of pure young woman in Paola, in fact, he encountered her right after his father left. And in fact, if he hadn't encountered her, the scene of his father leaving would have immediately abutted upon the scene of Steiner putting his children to sleep. And Fellini probably doesn't want to make that so obvious, so he inserts Paola at that time. So here we get the, the form of purgatorio as the party breaks up and Marcello turns away from this redemptive sign of Paola and chooses one of the sexy women to follow. Let's have this next excerpt. Can I have the excerpt, please? Ah, yes. Cosa c'è laggiù? Dove? And the strange fish that has come out of the sea has a Christological meaning. It's been buried for three days. Ah, oh, la natura. L'alba mi fa sempre effetto. Tanto. Hmm? Ieri sera stavo così bene, tutto truccata. Adesso mi sento tutto appiccicosa. Ma a me, che mi interessa più di questo? Io ormai mi voglio ritirare. Sento che devo far venire. And notice all the questions that are put about this monster. Oh. 
Però mi sa che più se ne ritirano, più ne vengono fuori. Che ne so? Se ne ritirano due e ne vengono fuori dieci. Nel 65 sarà tutta una depravazione completa. Ah, no! Mamma mia, che schifetta ne verrà fuori. Uh. Indietro, indietro, stare indietro. Andiamo, che arrivi, più. Economic interpretation, monstrous interpretation. They're filled with Medusa. Dead three days, Christological interpretation. And then a sexual question. And one asks whether, which is the top and which is the bottom, as if he wants to screw it. Again, economic. E questo insiste a guardare. And now in this dawn scene, the Matilda figure will appear. type of the scene on the rooftop. The difficult distance, the sound of the water making it impossible to hear. The gestures. And he's the one who turns around. Dantean vision, he prefers him. Okay. This question of education is crucial. There was a film made in the early 70s in 16 millimeter based on the biography of the Sardinian linguist um, Leda. And uh, he had a terrible childhood. It was a brutal father and he was a, a shepherd. And the, his autobiography was called Padre Pedrone. And the Tavioni brothers made a 16 millimeter film based upon it. And in this film, Leda describes how entering the Italian army, the required military duty, he couldn't speak proper Italian, he was uneducated, and he was tutored by a fellow soldier, played by um, uh, Nanni Moretti, uh, an Italian filmmaker of Super 8 films, who made a, uh, a Super 8 autobiography called Io Sono Autarchico, I Am Self 
directed. And at a certain point, uh, Leda has to teach himself Latin. Or, and uh, his friend helps him with Latin. And at a crucial moment, when he's inside a tank, he quotes Virgil. Now let's look at this particular scene as soon as uh, my projectionist has it ready. Can we have the excerpt from Padre Padrone? He has to learn to make a radio that works. Can we have the sound? Because at the time this film was made, and until recently, a good gymnasio education in Italy involved learning Latin and Greek. as a model for autobiographical discourse. Tell the story of your... Pater, patris, brother, brothers. Dominus, domini. Puella, puel, meretrix, meretrix, onza sponte. Mamma, mamme. Mamma, mamme. Ma non vi detto che in latino mamma si dice mater? In latino mamma vuol dire mammella, petto, <laughs> tetto. Seno. Pensa in latino. Gavinus est tuus malus discipulus. Caesar tuus optimus magister est. Ego pastor et agricola sum. Ergo servus glebis. Ego doctor sum senza in occupazione. Ergo servus glebe. Ego sum... Tu es, tu es amicus meus. Di un amico si sanno morte e miracoli. Tu invece sei chiuso più di un riccio. This reproach opens up for him both Virgil e and autobiography. Libro secondo. Conti quere omnes intenti que ora tenevan. Inde toro pater, eneazzi corso sabalto, infandum regina, iubes renovare dolor, qui sta lefando, tempere ta lacrimis. Ok. That is the Virgilian education that permeates so much of Italian culture and gives sense to the Dantean tag that Marcello's father gives. Now, not everything is based upon simple quotations. That the economic miracle that made uh, Rome such an attractive place to uh, foreigners in the late 1950s, so much so, by the way, that the influence of the Dolce Vita was so great that when Alfred Hitchcock made the birds, he has his heroine, Melanie Daniels, the daughter of a newspaper uh, owner. Uh, she has been a wild woman in Rome. What has she done? She has jumped into fountains, which is, comes directly from La Dolce Vita. But Hitchcock might have been aware that Fellini took the scene of the women sunbathing under the helicopter from his earlier film, uh, rear window, where at the very beginning of the film we see some women sunbathing on top of the apartment and a helicopter circles around them. 
in any case that uh, the economic miracle was spurred on by the discovery of enormous natural gas uh, uh, found in the um, Po Valley. And then the establishment outside of Ravenna of oil refineries, which polluted the entire zone. So that area that Dante once associated with these pines, the, the, the Pinette di Chiasi, Chiasi is the, the port of Ravenna, has become the locus of the most polluted area in all of Italy. And the film begins with a kind of hellish vision of the neurotic uh, woman, uh, Giuliana, and her son wandering during a strike in the late 1960s in a period once, once the Italian parliament had moved towards the left, had repudiated the fascist votes and incorporated socialist and communist votes, all sorts of strikes broke out in in Italy, and extreme left groups began to emerge, uh, climaxing with the captive, uh, with the capture and the murder of Aldo Mauro, the, the prime minister who engineered the opening to the left. And here we have Antonioni at a period which the, the Venice Film Festival called La Cinema Sico Analitico, that is the the influence of psychoanalysis in Italy and the concern with, um, with uh, ecology. So that this factory that Corrado uh, owns is located right at the very, can I have this excerpt? Say, ma, no se ne parla nemmeno. The very place that Siamo once was statale. Dantean paradise on earth. <laughs> Niente da fare, neanche l'anice. Te l'avevo detto. Quelli di questi sono elementi che hanno fatto il corso di specializzazione. And he has a list of people who he's trying to recruit for a new outpost. Ottimi elementi, Bonelli per esempio, è un capo che parte. Okay, enough of this. We go on to the next excerpt. Now, for Danteans and for Italians steeped in Dante, Ulysses, Odysseus, is not the hero we think of from the Odyssey, but the horrible, lying seducer of um, hell and inferno, the, the, fig the figure who invented the Trojan horse and destroyed Troy, which led to the founding of, of Rome. And the figure here, Corrado, who is a seducer of his employee's wife, is recruiting people for the very same mission that U Ulysses in Dante seeks adventure. And he takes a shipload of uh, people in search of adventure. He wants to conquer Pur Mount Purgatory, which is at Antarctica. And so that particular, uh, have we gone past the scene? I don't think so, no. Okay. Um, he, he wants to uh, conquer Ant, uh, Mount Purgatory by simple conquest. And his ship goes down, destroying him and all the crew that he seduced. And, ah, it goes back here. A little further back. Oh, yes, I guess this will do. Yes. So this for someone un anno. who is Ma potete telefonare una volta al mese. educated, for an educated Italian, this is a figure of Ulysses. He is trying to recruit people to go to the very zone where Odysseus's ship went down. Now, Antonioni is not at all concerned with what Pasolini accused Fellini of, that is, Catholic irrationalism. What he is concerned with here is using the Dantean model to suggest that, that the pollution that is now the result of the economic miracle is a kind of infernal situation. 
And in fact, enough of this, that the very end of the film, we see yellow poisonous smoke coming out of a chimney. And the uh, little boy asks his mother, doesn't it kill the birds? He says, no, she says, the birds have learned to avoid it. And of course, if we read in Purgatorio about the Augaletti who sing in the Pinetti di Chiasi, uh, these are the little songbirds. And uh, what Antonioni has done is reversed the uh, Dantean model. Now, all my talk today has been predicated on the presumption that uh, educated Italians are as steeped in Dantean lore as uh, uh, we would be in Shakespeare or Americans perhaps in Emerson without even knowing it. Naturally, there's a large diversity of different Dantes among the different filmmakers. Those who have opposing political, religious, and aesthetic positions, but they all allude to the commedia. And I don't want to suggest that any of these films uh, cannot be appreciated or understood or even taught without reference to, to Dante. Instead, I want to simply conclude uh, by offering the suggestion that in periods of great moral and political crisis, the great national poet of political prophecy and, and of personal salvation in Italy will linger in the imagination of filmmakers, as different as Fellini at his most Catholic and Antonioni at his most psychoanalytical. Okay, I think, I hope that I've made the point. Uh, now we will take a break, and if anybody has any questions, I think I'm supposed to go next door and field them.